can all get started. Yes, can hear it fine. Perfect. Yes, yes. Perfect. Yep. Okay. So this morning, I uh, just wanted to talk to you a little bit about disaster response and the USACE role in that. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about our planning and response teams and their responsibilities. We'll talk specifically about a, a recent uh, response operation, Hurricane Ida. And then um, I'm glad to hear a lot of uh, engineering firms and uh, other partners on the line. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about partnering opportunities. So um, to get started with, USACE when, in any disaster has two authorities really that we, that we work under. We work under public law um, 8499 and that's the flood fight. So if you look down at the down arrow, um, those are our own authorities and we'll talk about that a little bit. And if you look at the arrow pointing, I guess, right on the screen, we work under the Stafford Act in support of FEMA. So in any disaster, you might see the Corps of Engineers castle out there working either under our own authorities or in support of FEMA. Public Law 8499, this is our flood fight. And uh, so we have our own funding. We're authorized by Congress. Um, you know, levees and dams is what you mostly think about with this, but it's it's everything, you know, it's preparing, it's getting super sacks and sandbags. Uh, currently in the Northwest, we are, we are in the midst of a flood fight, our Seattle district. Um, I think somebody said she was from California. I'm not sure how many of these atmospheric rivers you, you've gotten a taste of, but we went from drought and wildfire to absolute inundation and soil saturation out there over 100,000 sandbags that have been in place. Uh, and then once the atmospheric river, you know, goes through, we have a short amount of time to do emergency repairs um, on those levees, which are holding up, but um, they were designed at a 50 to 100 year. And we're looking at, in some cases, a 500 year estimated flood up in the Northwest. And then of course, uh, when it's not flood season, doing the rehabilitation, coastal and flood management, um, and then establishing the partnerships and keeping those strong. As part of the national response framework, there are 15 emergency support functions. And these just, this framework basically just organizes federal response uh, in support to uh, local, tribal, state. Uh, you know, our, our role is definitely in support. Um, as part of this national response framework, remember I said under the Stafford Act, uh, you say supports, supports FEMA. We are the primary agency um, for uh, ESF3, Emergency Support Function 3, and then we're supporting in several other functions. So under ESF3, Emergency Support Function 3, this is where you've likely heard a lot of uh, USACE efforts. So we are the designated lead for this. Um, debris management. Uh, if we're not doing the actual contracts, we could be brought in to oversee the contracts. Temporary power, not just our own um, Pittsburgh district that oversees the, that. That's part of our Lakes and Rivers Division, one of the nine that David uh, talked about before. They sort of oversee temporary emergency power. And of course, we have the 249th Prime Power Battalion, a whole battalion full of extremely smart soldiers um, that are, are trained in medium voltage and they go out and do not only the assessments and the scoping but also oversee the emplacement of the temporary um, of the generators. Temporary roofing, you've um, no doubt heard about the blue roofs and, and our efforts there and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that later. Infrastructure assessment, that's always huge. Temporary housing, I'll talk a little bit about that in the context of Hurricane Ida, and this is a very challenging, um, very challenging mission uh, due, due to a number of reasons. Urban search and rescue, people might not realize that USACE has teams that go out and do urban search and rescue. Um, most recently, they went down and responded as part of everybody else that poured into Florida uh, with the Surfside uh, condominium collapse. So. Um, Anyway, these are just some an overview of the things we do under the emergency support function three. So um, 
the PRTs, that's who oversees the contracts for all the things that I just talked about. And so there's 29 response teams. You can see the types of teams along the, the left side of the slide here. Um, these are civilian volunteers and um, they're scattered throughout the core. You can see um, the MSCs listed here are major subordinate commands. So North Atlantic Division would be where you guys fall under. But these PRTs, full of civilian volunteers, they go through training um, to really understand their ESF3 support area. But their main job is to oversee the contracts for these missions. And um, so just a great group of volunteers um, that stay really busy, either training or responding. Just wanted to give you a context for for what, uh, what the last 10 years have, have been like. This is what we call the wheel of misfortune. <laughs> and anytime someone uh, leaves, leaves the, uh, the USACE operations center, we give this to them in a frame presentation, you know, with all the disasters that they've been a part of. But just to give you a bit of context for the scope of disaster response for the Corps of Engineers, over the last 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, 241 events, which um, that's 61 cyclones, 45 severe storms, 20 major wildfires, 13 tornadoes and earthquakes, all totaling $8 billion worth of um, disaster response and over 840, I think it's 846 FEMA mission assignments. So, um, FEMA mission assignments are how they give us the mission to go out and with funding and, and use those PRTs to provide assistance. So just, and, and if you, you know, are reading the climate change experts and this is only going to get worse, it appears, and, um, and more intense. And so the wheel of misfortune will continue to, uh, to grow. So let's talk about a, a recent, uh, disaster that we are still responding to. On August 29th at noon, Hurricane Ida slammed into uh, Fushan in Louisiana. And uh, I have gotten a full lesson. I am semi-fluent in Cajun now, uh, just learning all these, these places. And uh, I have an interpreter down there in the New Orleans district that helps me understand how to say all these things. Um, this was the fifth largest storm to hit the continental U.S. in its history, right, in all of its history. And it was the second largest storm to hit uh, Louisiana the, 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 in terms of damages. So, um, you know, we're talking 150 mile an hour sustained winds. The, the most damaging storm, of course, was Hurricane Katrina, and that was in 2005. But the eerie thing about this, y'all, if you could have seen us, huddled in the UOC watching this thing, is it hit on the exact day, August 29th of Katrina. So 16 years later, Hurricane Ida, the second most damaging storm in Louisiana history uh, hit. So we definitely knew we had pre-positioned -pre teams in there and that weathered the storm. And uh, we waited to see the damages and uh, pretty significant. So I talked a little bit about, you know, the two authorities really that USACE provides response. Um, one being P Public Law 8499, that's under our own authorities to keep the channels open and, and uh, commerce still moving. So within a few days, we were able to get the Mississippi River cleared. Um, that involved blowing power lines. So there was power lines that had been dropped and were dangling over the river, and so nothing could get in and out. Uh, it involved a lot of shoaling. Um, it involved just debris in the in the channel itself. And so, within two days, they we were able to blow the power lines and uh, safely remove those and clear and at least get the Mississippi River itself up and and running again. But it took. Uh, quite some time to clear this Gulf intercoastal waterway that you see here. All of the bayous and, and bypasses, and, and this is just a, you know, a snapshot in time um, 
of what they closed before the storm hit. And then afterwards, you can imagine uh, the, during a time immediately following initial efforts, all air and all uh, uh, navigation was dedicated to search and rescue. But within a few days, we got a good picture of what the Gulf Intercoastal uh, Waterway was going to look like and set out a plan to get um, contract dredgers uh, and our own dredgers out there uh, moving. And it took until October 31st. So the storm hit August 29th, October uh, 31st. All of the Gulf, Gulf Intercoastal Waterways were re reopened. Um, and it, it was a high adventure getting that done. But um, definitely heroic efforts under the Mississippi Valley Division, um, one of our nine major subordinate commands. So let's talk about in support of FEMA. Um, in support of FEMA, we had over 30 mission assignments. Again, that's how they give us the funding and the authority to go out and, and do work in the separate ESF3 functions that, that we talked about earlier. So to date, we've received over $350 million. Um, you can see some of the stats. This is an infographic that we publish every day. This specific one was from October 31st, the same day that we finally restored all of the navigation. Um, you can see some of the, the, the more notable figures on this thing. Um, we'll talk about blue roofs on the, on the next slide, but uh, infrastructure assessments, did a lot of those. Unwatering. So after Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, August 29th, uh, the Corps of Engineers quite famously uh, received $14.5 billion to put in the Hurricane Storm Disaster Reduction, a uh, Risk Reduction System, the HISDRs. And uh, if any of you were watching the news, uh, you saw that it performed very well as designed. It was uh, remarkable to the difference between um, what Hurricane Katrina did when this system wasn't in place versus um, you know, when Hurricane Ida hit, there was very little flooding in New Orleans. This system of barriers, gates, flood walls, and levees um, all, you know, basically kept East Jefferson, New Orleans, St. Bernard parishes. Now, if you're from Louisiana, you say parishes, uh, all free of flooding. Unfortunately, the other uh, low-lying parishes uh, did not um, fare as well. Um, and they're, you know, poor, poorer parishes, Plaquemines Parish, the East Bank and Lafitte. Uh, so we, unwatering here, we made levee cuts uh, where necessary. Basically those levees, they act like a swimming pool. Uh, if, if they fill up, you know, and their pumps aren't working, that's like a swimming pool and the water can't get back out. So we made uh, 21 uh, deliberate uh, cuts in the levees to let the water drain out. We still have pumps um, on site. These are pumps that you guys uh, are smaller pumps you've seen at work in the New York subway system, perhaps, uh, dating back to Superstorm Sandy. Um, but these are bigger pumps that we put at um, Plaquemines Parish, East Bank, East Bank and Lafitte to help them get the water out. Um, probably just go to the next slide and show you this, this is a disaster in itself. This is our command and control chart. And I wanted to point out to you guys, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, but here's us up here, headquarters USACE. And of course, you know, you had the governor uh, over on the right side of your, your, um, your slide. You see Northcom, they had a role in this, obviously. Uh, and then the middle, your Title 32 National Guard Forces. So what I wanted to highlight is under our two authorities, we organized our command and control to match that. And so the New Orleans district commander, uh, Colonel Steve Murphy, he goes by Murph. He took the, our own authorities, the PL 8499, the clearing and the dredging of the channels for navigation. And then our Memphis district commander, um, that's Colonel Zach Miller he did all of the ESF3 functions and they all fell under him. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm scrolling around it. Um, 
one of the main uh, missions right out the gate, the first mission we got was Tent Power. A uh, little bit different dynamic with Tent Power this time. The state really wanted, you know, their assets to take the lead role. They're always in the lead role, but they wanted to do the, uh, the majority of the connections. So we did a lot of the prep supporting work prepping the generators, getting the generator yard set, um, assessments with the 249th prime power soldiers. They were out doing assessments, getting uh, critical infrastructure. The first generator that went in was for a uh, hospital and the second one was for a veteran's home. So that gives you an understanding of uh, prioritization and, and what they were focused on. The other thing I wanna highlight on this chart is down at the bottom, uh, you see a lot of roving ROE stations. So the Corps of Engineers has uh, big RV looking co communications rolling platforms. And we sent those out in the most remote of bayous to collect requests for blue roofs. And uh, we were highly successful with that. We um, six different locations, we immediately fanned out. So people that you could sign up online, but if you couldn't get to the internet and power was out and uh, the communications were out for quite a while, um, you had to go to a walk-up station. And so converting some fire stations for, for brick and mortar type locations, but also these roving communications platforms allowed people from the farthest reaches to, um, to let us know that they needed a, a blue roof. And we received over 58,000 requests, 58,000. Eventually that was whittled down um, by the time we did the assessments or they took their name, they selected that they didn't want it anymore or um, uh, they didn't want to sign the rights of entry. Uh, that, that made it down a little bit, but we ended up installing over 33,000 temporary roofs, blue roofs. Um, some exciting innovations too. Um, in addition to the blue roofs that you guys are all familiar with, we also did a prototype of shrink wrap roof, which is exactly what it sounds. You're, you're basically just putting the plastic over the roof and sucking the air out so that it adheses. No, uh, no uh, nails or, or anything like that required. The exciting thing about that is roofs that aren't structurally able to get a blue roof for whatever reason, not high enough pitch or too much damage. This was an exciting alternative, although it was very expensive. Um, so we're not sure, you know, it would definitely be used. Blue roofs are not going away. That's that's the, um, but for limited use, the shrink wrap proved to be a, an exciting alternative. Um, so uh, now we're, you know, basically in day 90 and uh, the, the Power mission is closed. The roofing mission is closed. Um, we're still doing the unwatering. They want our pumps to stay in those parishes until the end of flood season, basically. Um, uh, so at least through December. And now our major effort remaining with Ida, 90 days into it, is temporary housing. And uh, this is just historically a challenging mission. FEMA has the lead for housing, USACE does not have the lead as you know, and that's different from, from power or um, roofing and, and missions uh, like that. So uh, you can imagine we're doing large, we have about over 4,000 people that are still looking for temporary housing options. Um, and we're doing everything from big, big sites that look like trailer parks, haul and install to smaller, to smaller uh, site locations. Uh, site adaptations in some cases. Getting approvals is is hard. Um, just the politics of putting uh, temporary housing shelters in certain areas, uh, people don't want them. And then, you know, the second thing is if we bring in, bring in a bunch of uh, housing units and do the haul and install type mission, um, finding an area suitable for it basically any suitable land already has something on it and the big wide open spaces are in flood zones and so you know just negotiating the approvals for that has proven difficult so let's get into a little bit about contracts so i want to finish up i got three more slides and then um, i'm just going to open it up for a bit of 
uh, question or discussion. I know there's a lot of you with experience on the line. So if you've got experience with this, uh, maybe you can jump in at the end. Um, contracts. USACE has a large and robust contracting capability. Um, so uh, most recently, I've seen this used with Operation Allies Welcome. So shifting gears from, from Ida just a little bit, um, as you know, the United States just executed the largest um, NEO operation in U.S. history, evacuating over 65,000 uh, Afghans out of um, Afghanistan and uh, getting them into the special immigrant visa program or, or refugee status. And um, so, you know, uh, you guys understand that Kandahar fell very quickly, quicker than anybody anticipated. Uh, there was a major effort to get people out quickly. And we had um, Germany and Qatar and Kuwait uh, that allowed us to push these um, Afghan refugees into them for only a limited period of time. And then they had, they had to go somewhere else. And so currently these Afghans are on eight U.S. installations across the, the across the country, um, but you can imagine with over 65,000 uh, people, and we're talking in various stages: children, adults, sick, pregnant, uh, just uh, you any sort of scenario you name it. I'm happy to talk about this more in the end if you want. But uh, we got word that the first plane. Uh, would be landing in less than 24 hours. And so our contracting and leasing folks set about getting the permits through the Department of State. So negotiated on behalf of the DOD with the Department of State who had the initial lead. Now it's the Department of Homeland Security um, to con the hotel on Fort Lee, Virginia or uh, the convention center outside of Dulles uh, Airport because there were there were planes stacked up on the runways in, in Dulles and Philadelphia. And we're talking within 24 hours being able to, to contract or lease facilities uh, in support of this mission. So uh, uh, large and robust contracting and real estate leasing. Um, as I said before, 